Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. And for today's episode, I will be looking at Man in the Modern Age by Carl Jaspers. So with this book, we jump back to the 1930s, which is where we had kind of been dwelling with a few other books recently. This one was uh, originally written in German. Jaspers is a German philosopher. Uh, It was first released in 1931. The English translation was released in 1933. This book I'm reading is a revision of that English translation. This one published in 1957. And uh, it's not Jasper's most famous work, but I think it's one that is fairly well known. His most famous work is called a three-volume set called Philosophy. Pretty simple, straightforward title there. Rather hard to get the English translation of that. Kind of pricey. Um, it's, uh, It's kind of a challenging book, I found. It was difficult. It's going to be probably somewhat difficult for me as a non-professional philosopher uh, to really analyze it well, but I'll do my best. I've got a number of sections I want to read. Like all my episodes, I'll be reading some parts here and then providing a little bit of analysis. This episode is probably going to be a little bit more heavy on the reading and a little less heavy on the analysis. I have a bunch of, I believe I have 11 sections here I want to read, and some of them are a little bit longer. So, um, you know, some of my episodes have more reading, some have less. This one will probably have more. Uh, He talks about a number of things, just to provide a a bit of a summary. Um, He talks primarily, it seems like he talks about apparatus, well, three things, I guess, uh, technique, apparatus, and masses. Uh, Insofar as he talks about masses, he's talking about like mass man, similar to what we saw from uh, Jose Ortega y Gasset in The Revolt of the Masses. He talks a little bit along those same lines about mass man although perhaps less critical and more sympathetic. Uh, And then he talks about technique and apparatus. Technique is sort of like technology. Um, Probably could be translated as technology, but it's translated as technique. And uh, and then he talks about apparatus, which which seems to me sort of like a a social structure. Um, The bureaucratic society, the administrative state, the whole... Uh, system of modern society, the social interactions and the social institutions that we've developed in the modern world, collectively referred to as apparatus. Although it's it's more involved than that. That's a real kind of summary uh, view of the things that he talks about. He's really talking about um, perhaps meaninglessness in the modern age on account of these factors. And uh, and a lack of uh, groundedness, and a lack of connection to our history, and a lack of spirituality uh, that has caused us to be sort become sort of aimless and confused and filled with a, a sense of existential unease because of our rootlessness. I guess would be the the best way to put it. Uh, the sections I'm going to read of are all probably I'd say the first two thirds of the book. The last third of the book starts to get maybe a little bit, I don't know if over my head is the right word, but a little bit wonky, a a little bit out out in left field, more deep into the existential, um, you know, self-analysis of selfhood and uh, and other somewhat strange ideas. I'm going to leave the the last third of the book probably alone. Um, I guess maybe I'll read one more section here. I don't want to leave it completely un, untouched. There's a little bit where he talks about culture. Uh, I might go ahead and jump into that portion a little bit, but um, I'm going to just move through the sections I want to read um, sequentially, starting from the very beginning. Uh, and we'll see if we can make heads or tails of what Carl Jaspers is talking about. So, uh, jumping in in the, in the very beginning, he's talking about how the, the, the modern world is in a state of flux. It doesn't have the uh, groundedness. It doesn't have the consistency and stability uh, that the world used to have. And so, um, like, all these sections are sort of long. 
Um, this one is about three pages that I'm reading here. And he says, quote, For more than a century, the problem concerning the situation of mankind has been growing ever more urgent. And each generation has endeavored to solve that problem according to its own lights. But whereas in former days, only a few were anxiously considering the dangers to which our mental world is exposed, since the war, the gravity of the peril has become manifest to everyone. The topic, however, is not merely inexhaustible, but insusceptible of fixed definition, inasmuch as it is modified by the very act of concentrating attention on it. Past situations can be regarded as finished, as having had the curtain rung down on them, as having had their day and ceased to be, whereas the stimulating characteristic of a present situation is that thinking about it helps to determine what will become of it. Everyone knows that the world situation in which we live is not a final one. There were periods in which man felt his world to be durable, an unchanging intermediate between the vanished golden age and the end that would come in due course when the Almighty's purposes were fulfilled. Man accommodated himself to life as he found it without wishing to change it. His activities were limited to an endeavor to better his own position amid environing circumstances deemed to be substantially unalterable. Within these circumstances, he had safe harborage, linked as he was, both with heaven and with earth. The world was his own world, even though it was of no account, because for him, true being existed only in a transcendental realm. As compared with man in those eras, man today has been uprooted, having become aware that he exists in what is but a historically determined and changing situation. It is as if the foundations of being had been shattered. How self-evident to the man of old seemed the unity of life and knowledge has become plain to us now that we realize that the life of our fellows in the past was spent under conditions in which reality was, as it were, veiled. We, on the other hand, have become able to see things as they really are, and that is why the foundations of life quake beneath our feet. For now that the identity of thought and being, hitherto unchallenged, has ceased to exist for us, we see only, on the one hand, life, and on the other, our own and our companions' awareness of that life. We do not, as did our forefathers, think merely of the world. We ponder how it is to be comprehended, doubting the validity of every interpretation. And behind every apparent unity of life and the consciousness of life, there looms the distinction between the real world and the world as we know it. That is why we live in a movement, a flux, a process, in virtue of which the changing knowledge enforces a change in life, and in turn, changing life enforces a change in the consciousness of the knower. This movement, this flux, this process, sweeps us into the whirlpool of unceasing conquest and creation, of loss and gain, in which we painfully circle, subject in the main to the power of the current, but able now and then to exert ourselves within a restricted sphere of influence. For we do not only live in a situation proper to mankind at large, but we experience this situation as it presents itself in specific historical circumstances, issuing out of a previous situation and progressing toward a subsequent one. The result is that our consciousness of the movement, in which we ourselves are one of the factors, has a strange twofoldedness. Since the world as we now know it is not definitive, our hopes, no longer anchored in transcendence, have turned toward the sublunary sphere, alterable by our own endeavors, so that we have faith in the possibility of earthly perfectionment. On the other hand, since, even in favorable situations, the individual has no more than restricted powers of intervention and cannot fail to recognize that the actual results of his doings depend far more upon general environing conditions than upon the aims he is trying to fulfill, since, therefore, he is made poignantly cognizant of the small extent of his sphere of influence as compared with the vast possibilities of which he is abstractly aware, and since, finally, the course of the world, which no one is satisfied with, seems to him in many ways undesirable, a feeling of powerlessness has become rife, and man tends to regard himself as dragged along in the wake of events which, when in a more sanguine mood, he had hoped to guide. One inspired with a religious conviction that man was as naught in the face of transcendence was unperturbed by changing events. Changes were the outcome of God's will and were not felt to clash with other conceivable possibilities. 
Today, however, the pride, which aims at universal understanding, and the arrogance of one who regards himself as master of the world, and therefore wants to mold it to his liking, knock at all doors, while their frustration arouses a feeling of terrible impotence. How man is to accommodate himself to this and rise superior to it is one of the most vital questions of the present situation. End quote. Okay, so as you can see, it's a somewhat challenging uh, writing here. Those are just the first three pages, um, and it doesn't get any easier from there. But what he's talking about is how uh, everything is more uncertain now than it used to be. He says that uh, people nowadays, they know that the world is changeable um, by us, that humans have the ability to affect the world and change the world. And it's not, it's not just that God lays out this plan and we're all following along with it. And we, we know that there's, there's a sort of course that everything is destined to go along and we can't really change it. It's all in God's hands and that, that's gone. So now it's up to us to do this or that or the other. And yet each person has a fairly limited amount of capability to change things. So while they see the world continually changing, and they know that this change is in part due to the actions of people, they also know that they themselves as an individual have a limited ability to change the world. And so this creates a sort of sense of um, impotence that we know that if we were just a little bit more uh, powerful, if we were just a little bit more on top of this, or that, or the other, that we would have more control. That it's like the control over the world is dangling like a prize in front of us that we can't quite reach. Somehow it would be possible for us to guide humanity, for us to guide you know, our lives, the lives of our communities, and yet it's always just a little bit out of reach. There's always just a little bit more power over the world that we just haven't got, uh, which is, you know, in combination with the fact that the world is changing much more rapidly, socially, technologically, uh, spiritually, the, the way people view the world, their understanding of the world, the, no the level of knowledge about the world is constantly changing, the political situation is constantly changing, Technolo the level of technology is really like changing very rapidly, everything is always in flux. Um, we can't attribute it to anyone or anything, but like what other people are, are doing who have more power than us. Um, and so it, it's, it's a sort of, uh, lack of contentment that everything is as it should be. Like the idea that everything is simply as it should be is, is not an acceptable notion anymore. Um, everything's in flux and, and we're just sort of powerless to do anything about it or we feel that way. And so that's, that's what he's talking about it. This, this inability to, uh, to, to have control on the world. He says, man today has been uprooted, having become aware that he exists in what is but a historically determined and changing situation. It is as if, as if the foundations of being have been shattered. Um, he says, the movement, the flux, the process, sweeps us into the whirlpool of unceasing conquest and creation of loss and gain in which we painfully circle, subject in the main to the power of the current, but na able now and then to exert ourselves within a restricted sphere of influence. He says this balance between being swept along and set and charting our own fate, uh, and we kind of stumble in between these two, these two scenarios, and that's a, a major cause of our, our discontent and our, sensation, our sense of powerlessness. Uh, so moving on from there, actually, I just want to take a moment to, um, to, to, to just say something about this, this book and the premise here. Um, this is in large part a critique of modernity. And I spoke in some previous episodes about how, um, you know, conservatism really depends upon and is founded, founded upon, especially like a reactionary strain to conservatism is founded upon a critique of modernity. And so although... I don't think Jaspers at the time considered himself to be a conservative. Everything has changed so much in the world that we can certainly look at this now, nearly a hundred years later, uh, and find uh, components of conservatism baked into the premise of a, of a critique of, of modernity, baked into the premise that uh, something, something of value has been lost. And it may be the case that it, it, there's no turning back. There's no undoing what has 
happened. And so the present is something that we simply have to accept. And yet there's also, you know, no doubt that there's, you know, if, if you have a conservative inclination, um, then you recognize and accept and um, even mourn the loss of something of value. And um, it's not enough to just say, you know, well, it is what it is, uh, because in a sense, like the world is in our hands to shape the way we want. And so um, there are certainly aspects of modernity that um, we should be comfortable criticizing and more so we should feel comfortable making effort an effort to undo some things that have been done or to change some aspects of modernity and to um, bring back something that we feel has been lost. So um, moving on from there, he talks a little bit about comparing our modern situation with uh, situations of the past. And he says, quote, the feeling that social conditions are hopelessly disordered and that no firm abiding place remi remains is not new to history. Thucydides' account of conditions in Hellas during the Peloponnesian War is a testimony from the ancient world. But to strike home in the new times, the notion must be more penetrating than can be a general conception of the possibilities of revolution, disorder, a loosening of moral ties. Since the days of Schiller, the modern mind has become aware of the loss of a sense of divine presence in the world, a loss characteristic of recent centuries. In the West, this process has been carried to a far greater extreme than elsewhere. Doubtless, there were skeptics in ancient India and in the classical world, men for whom nothing but the immediate present, as it discloses itself to our senses, counted for anything, the immediate present inexorably grasped and itself accounted as null. But even so, for them, the world as a whole was still a spiritualized entity. In the West, as a sequel of the spread of Christianity, skepticism of another kind became possible. The idea of a transcendental creator existing before, after, and apart from the world he had fashioned out of chaos reduced that world to the level of a mere creature. The demons, known to paganism, vanished from the realm of nature, and the world became a godless world. All that had been created was now the object of human cognition, rethinking, as it were, God's thoughts. Protestant Christianity took the matter very seriously. The natural sciences, with their rationalization, mathematicization, and mechanization of the world, were closely akin to this form of Christianity. The great scientific investigators of the 17th and 18th centuries were pious Christians. But when, finally, advancing doubt made an end of God the Creator, there was left in being no more than the mechanical world system recognized by the natural sciences, a world system which would never have been so crudely denuded of spirit, but for its previous degradation to the status of a creature. The despiritualization of the world is not the outcome of the unfaith of individuals, but is one of the possible consequences of a mental development, which here has actually led to nothingness. We feel the unprecedented vacancy of existence, a sense of vacancy, against which even the keenest skepticism of classical times was safeguarded by the richly peopled fullness of an undecayed mythical reality with which the durerum natura of Lucretius the Epicure Epicurean is instinct. Such a development is not, indeed, absolutely inevitable to the human consciousness, for it presupposes a misunderstanding of the true significance of natural science and an unduly rigid application of its categories to all being. But, as foresaid, it is possible, and it has actually occurred, having been promoted by the overwhelming success of science in the technical and practical fields. What, in all the millenniums of human history and prehistory, no god has been able to do for man, man has done for himself. It is natural enough that in these achievements of his, he should discern the true inwardness of being, until he shrinks back in alarm from the void he has made for himself. Moderns are inclined to compare the present situation with that which prevailed during the decline of the classical systems, with the fall of the Greek states and the decay of Hellenism, or with the third century of the Christian era when ancient cultures were collapsing. Yet there are important differences. Classical civilization 
was the civilization of no more than a small part of the world, in an area which did not comprise, within its bounds, all the factors of the future of mankind. Today, when communications are worldwide, the whole human race must enter the domain of Western civilization. At the beginning of the Dark Ages, population was declining. Now, it has increased, and is still increasing, beyond measure. Then, the menace to civilization came from without. Now, it comes from within. But the most conspicuous difference between our time and the 3rd century AD is that then, technique was stationary or retrograde, whereas now, it is advancing with great strides. The favorable and unfavorable chances lie outside the range of possible prediction. The objectively conspicuous new factor, which cannot fail henceforward to modify the foundations of human existence, and thus provide it with new conditions, is this development of the world of technique. For the first time, an effective control of nature has begun. If we think of our world as being buried, subsequent excavators would not bring to light any such beautiful objects as those which have come down to us from classical days whose street pavement, even, is a delight to us. They would, however, discover such vast quantities of iron and concrete as to make it plain that during the last few decades, as contrasted with all previous ages, man has begun to enwrap the planet in a mesh of apparatus. The step thus taken has been as momentous as that taken when our forefathers first began to use tools and we can already look forward to the day when the world will become one vast factory for the utilization of its matter and energy. For the second time, man has broken away from nature to do work which nature would never have done for herself, and which rivals nature in creative power. This work becomes actualized for us, not only in its visible and tangible products, but also in its functioning, and our hypothetical excavator would not be able from the vestiges of wireless masts and antenna, for instance, to infer the universality of the diffusion of news over the Earth's surface. The novelty of our century, the changes whose completion will set it so utterly apart from the past, are not, however, exhaustively comprised within the limits of the despiritualization of the world and its subjection to a regime of advanced technique. Even those who lack clear knowledge of the subject are becoming decisively aware that they are living in an epoch when the world is undergoing a change, so vast as to be hardly comparable to any of the great changes of past millenniums. The mental situation of our day is pregnant with immense dangers and immense possibilities, and it is one which, if we are inadequate to the tasks which await us, will herald the failure of mankind. Is it an end that draws near or a beginning? Is it perhaps a beginning as significant as that when man first became man, but now enriched by newly acquired means and the capacity for experience upon a new and higher level? End quote. So there's another long section there, several, like, uh, quite a few, well, four pages. Uh, and he addresses a number of, of points. Um, he points out how uh, historically there has always been people who have felt that uh, that conditions are disordered or that uh, there's no solid ground to stand on, but things now are different because, um, well, he, he talks about the despiritualization of the world, that there was always the notion uh, in, ancient, in the ancient, let's say, pre-Christian world, that there was a spirituality in the world, and he talks about the demons of paganism. He's talking about the spirits in the forests and the trees and the rivers and the towns and everything, the doorways and the fireplace and this and that, that and everything has a spirit to it. There's, it, they lived in a world that was filled with spirits, and then Christianity, like, um, desacralized the world and said that you know the only spirit is god and god is outside of the world i've talked about this in previous episodes the world and god are separate and all greatness and all spiritual power resides in god and none reside in the world and then once we began to say that well there is no god or we had moved moved beyond god what is the 
terminology he says he says when finally advancing doubt made an end of god the creator there was left in being no more than the mechanical world system recognized by the natural sciences so even before we had kind of began to really deeply doubt the existence of god we had already through the process of desacralizing the world had moved into understanding the world as mechanism and this this is from uh, Isaac Newton and Galileo and these these older earlier uh, forebears of science were themselves religious religious people but they didn't view the, the the material world as a spiritual entity it was a it was a mechanism it was like clockwork you know um, and God resided outside he was the clock maker you know um, and then you know, absent that external source of spirituality, what was left over was just the machine, just the mechanistic world. He says, uh, he says there was left in being no more than the mechanical world system recognized by the natural sciences, a world system which would never have been so crudely denuded of spirit, but for its previous degradation to the status of a creature. Basically saying that the world is like is like a creature, a creation of God. It's it's like a, an on the on the same level as as like an animal or a person, uh, but not imbued with with the sort of spiritual spiritual essence. And then he says that modern people are inclined to compare uh, the present situation with with past situations such as the fall of the Roman Empire or the decline of the Greek uh, city states. Uh, but he says that it's not really the same for several reasons, one of which is that uh, the, the changes that were occurring at the fall of the Roman Empire or the end of the Greek states uh, were only related to a portion of the world. They didn't relate to all of humanity, whereas now the whole world has been kind of absorbed into Western civilization. And if we face a crisis, it is therefore a global crisis. Um, we're not able to face, you know, a, cri a crisis here, a crisis there, and humanity continue continues on with the with the patchwork civilizations and cultures. We've become a global civilization, and the crisis therefore becomes a global crisis. And he says that another difference between then and now is that back then populations, you know, whenever there was a crisis, it would be paired with a decline in population, whereas now we have this sort of spiritual crisis. At the same time, we have exploding populations. And then there was uh, not an advance in technology, or there was even uh, retrograde technique, he says. He says, the most conspicuous difference between our time and the third century AD is that then technique was stationary or retrograde. Technique, he, he essentially means technology, whereas now it is advancing with great strides. The favorable and unfavorable chances lie outside the range of possible prediction. We don't know what's going to happen. And he goes on to talk about that um, elsewhere toward the end there when he says, uh, he says, is it an end that draws near or a beginning? Is it perhaps a beginning as significant as that when man first became man? So we could be on the verge of a whole new type of existence in our symbiosis with machines, you know, with the rise, of, I mean, this is almost 100 years ago, and all this stuff is very relevant today with the rise of, um, you know, artificial intelligence, um, human machine interaction, uh, you know, connecting our brains to machines doesn't seem quite as sci fi as it used to. And he talks about how the whole, uh, in the future, if there was uh, an excavator looking at our world, they would find not objects of beauty like we find from the classical world, but they would find a world more and more encased in machinery. And he does say, enwrapped uh, in, in the planet in a mesh of apparatus. Uh, so, so maybe when, he talk, when he's talking about apparatus, he's not just talking about social um, institutions, although I do think he's talking about that to some extent, but he's talking about stuff. Whereas technique, he might be talking about technological capacity. Apparatus, he's more, seems like he's talking about the, the, the stuff, the creations of technology, the objects with which we live, um, the accoutrements of modern society. So moving along from there, let's look uh, when he talks about at the beginning of, well, that was actually um, really like the, <laughs> the introduction. 
that I was reading from, and this is here is part one, uh, limits of the life order, and he talks more about technique and apparatus in this section here. He is also begins talking about uh, mass life or the masses, mass man. In this section, he hits on all three. So he says, quote, Estimates of the total population of the world are, for 1800, roughly 850 million. For the present time, 1800 million. This unprecedented increase, whereby the population has been considerably more than doubled in four-thirds of a century, was rendered possible by technical advances. The results of discoveries and inventions were as follows. A new basis for production, the organization of enterprises, a methodical increase in the productivity of labor, a worldwide and enor enormous improvement in the means of transport and communication, the codification of law, and the establishment of effective police systems, whereby public order was ensured, and, as the combined effect of all the foregoing, greatly improved facilities for anticipating the results of industrial and commercial enterprise. Huge undertakings can now be purposively guided from a single center, even though their employees are numbered by the hundred thousand and their tentacles extend over the entire surface of the globe. This development is associated with the rationalization of productive and distributive activity, resolves being made in accordance with knowledge and calculation instead of mere instinct and desire, and it is likewise associated with mechanization, all the work being done under detailed rules and regulations which apply to everyone concerned. Whereas in such matters, people used to wait upon events and make no more until something turned up, they now think things out beforehand and leave nothing to chance. With the result, however, that in many respects the individual worker becomes little more than a part of the machinery. The broad masses of the population could not exist today but for the titanic interlocking wheelwork of which each worker is one of the cogs. Thereby our elementary needs are supplied with an efficiency new to history. As late as the beginning of the 19th century there were famines in Germany, pestilences wrought havoc, infant mortality was terribly high, and very few persons lived to be old. Today, Famine during peacetime is unknown in Western civilized lands, whereas in 1750, the annual death rate among the inhabitants of London was 1 in 20. Today, it is 1 in 80. Thanks to insurance against illness and unemployment, in conjunction with other social welfare institutions, no one is nowadays left remorselessly exposed to the danger of death by starvation as used to be the lot of whole sections of the European population. In Asia, on the other hand, this risk is still regarded as a matter of course. End quote. Uh, so just to start out there, he's talking about the population uh, and how it has exploded. This is, again, reminiscent of what uh, Ortega y Gasset was talking about, this massive explosion in population. Um, and paired with that explosion... Uh, is, well, really the cause of that explosion is all of these systems put in place whereby everything is done rationally and in an organized fashion. And he says the individual worker becomes little more than a part of the machinery. The way the whole thing is structured to operate, there's no instinct, there's no desire, there's no guesswork, um, there's no whim. It's all pre-planned and by the by the imposition of rational technological decision making processes uh, it expands to become this global network and it allows a great many people to exist that would not have existed under previous systems one thing that it's important to note is where he says the broad masses of the population could not exist today but for the titanic interlocking wheel work of which each worker is one of the cogs. Thereby our elementary needs are supplied with an efficiency new to history. So that we've got a situation where the pop, this massive population cannot exist absent the system which has been created, uh, the technological administrative system, the apparatus which has been created to enable uh, this huge population growth. 
And what you find then is that there's no turning back because the, the system can't be undone without massive numbers of people starving to death. When that po- the more that population re- hits its absolute maximum and we, we continue tweaking the system to become more and more efficient, enabling that population to nudge up more and more and more and more, there's no, there, there, the whole thing is, is very susceptible to, uh, to like the, the, let's say the, the, the collapse or even the, um, uh, disruptions to the system have such very real world impacts on people's lives that it's, it's almost becomes impossible, but to continue serving the, the machine continue fulfilling the role of the cogs and continuing to expand the machine's capacity it doesn't go in any direction but forward and the population goes up and up and up now of course we've got a situation in the west now where pop the population um absent you know the the absent immigration let's say um the population the birth rate is has gone down and down and down and down so in in a sense you can pair the the expanding life span um you know the lower death rate and the longevity of people and the elimination of diseases and things like that you can pair that with a shrinking lowering birth rate to achieve a sort of stability um but again if the you know this this creates sort of a tenuous situation whereby if the systems of longevity uh, are disrupted, then absent a corresponding boom in the birth rate, you wind up with you know pretty significant catastrophic circumstances. Uh, and likewise, a, you know, absent a reduction in the birth rate, but with the imposition of the uh, mechanism you wind up with an exploding population, which is what we see in some parts of the world where the lifestyle continues to be to have large families and many children, but the infant mortality and the other like um, dangers and illnesses and things that would cause people to die without reaching um, the, you know, adulthood, uh, when, when those constraining factors are taken away, but the birth rate doesn't change, you see what we see in the, de- the developing world with these exploding populations. Um, jumping on from there, he continues talking about the masses. He says, quote, The rule of the masses affects the activities and habits of the individual. It has become obligatory to fulfill a function which shall in some way be regarded as useful to the masses. The masses and their apparatus are the object of our most vital interest. The masses are our masters, and for everyone who looks facts in the face, his existence has become dependent on them, so that the thought of them must control his doings, his cares, and his duties. He may despise them in their average aspects, or he may feel that the solidarity of all mankind is destined someday to become a reality, or he may, while not denying the responsibility which each man has for all, still hold more or less aloof, but it remains a responsibility he can never evade. He belongs to the masses." though they threaten to let him founder amid rhetoric and the commotions of the multitude. Even an articulated mass always tends to become unspiritual and inhuman. It is life without existence, superstition without faith. It may stamp all flat. It is disinclined to tolerate independence and greatness, but prone to constrain people to become as automatic as ants. When the titanic apparatus of the mass order has been consolidated, the individual has to serve it and must from time to time combine with his fellows in order to renovate it. If he wants to make his livelihood by intellectual activity, he will find it very difficult to do this except by satisfying the needs of the many. He must give currency to something that will please the crowd. They seek satisfaction in the pleasures of the table, eroticism, self-assertion, They find no joy in life if one of these gratifications be curtailed. They also desire some means of self-knowledge. They desire to be led in such a way that they can fancy themselves leaders. 
without wishing to be free, they would fain be accounted free. One who would please their taste must produce what is really average and commonplace, though not frankly styled such, must glorify or at least justify something as universally human. Whatever is beyond their understanding is uncongenial to them. One who would influence the masses must have recourse to the art of advertisement. The clamor of puffery is today requisite, even for an intellectual movement. The days of quiet and unpretentious activity seem over and done with. You must keep yourself in the public eye, give lectures, make speeches, arouse a sensation. Yet the mass apparatus lacks true greatness of representation, lacks solemnity. No one believes in festal celebrations, not even the participants. End quote. So he talks there about how uh, the ma essentially the masses rule everyone. Everyone must, in order to make a living, they must serve the masses however you feel about them, whether you like them, whether you despise them in their averageness, whether you try to stay aloof. Ultimately, in order to make a living, you must serve the masses. There's no escape from the fact they are your rulers. If you want to do something, you have to sell it. You have to learn the art of advertisement. You have to make a scene of something. You have to make the masses feel smart. You have to make the masses feel attractive. You have to make the masses feel free. You have to uh, puff the ego of the masses in order to sell things to make money to live. The masses are the masters of our lives, is essentially the thrust of that section. And moving on from there, he says, quote, Limits are imposed upon the life order by a specifically modern conflict. The mass order brings into being a universal life apparatus, which proves destructive to the world of a truly human life. Man lives as part of a social environment to which he is bound by remembered and prospective ties. Men do not exist as isolated units, but as members of a family in the home, as friends in a group, as part of this, that, or the other herd with well-known historical origins. He has become what he is thanks to a tradition, which enables him to look back into the obscurity of his beginnings and makes him responsible for his own future and that of his associates. Only in virtue of a long view before and after does he acquire a substantial tenure in that world in which he constructs out of his heritage from the past. His daily life is permeated by the spirit of a perceptibly present world, which, however small, is something other than himself. His inviolable property is a narrow space, the ownership of which enables him to share in the totality of human history. The technical life order which came into being for the supply of the needs of the masses did at the outset preserve these real worlds of human creatures by furnishing them with commodities. But when at length the time arrived, when nothing in the individual's immediate and real environing was any longer made, shaped, or fashioned by that individual for his own purposes, when everything that came came merely as the gratification of a momentary need to be used up and cast aside, when the very dwelling place was machine-made, when the environment had become despiritualized, when the day's work grew sufficient to itself and ceased to be built up into a constituent of the worker's life, then man was, as it were, bereft of his world. Cast adrift in this way, lacking all sense of historical continuity with past or future, man cannot remain man. The universalization of the life order threatens to reduce the life of the real man in a real world to mere functioning. But man, as individual, refuses to allow himself to be absorbed into a life order which would only leave him in being as a function for the maintenance of the whole. True, he can live in the apparatus with the aid of a thousand relationships on which he is dependent and in which he collaborates, but since he has become a mere replaceable cog in a wheel work regardless of his individuality, if he rebels, there is no other way in which he man can manifest his selfhood. End quote. So uh, that section there, talking about how um, you know people are not 
he's, he's in, a, in a sense he's drawing a distinction between the masses and like the social groups in which you're naturally a part. We're not just atoms, you know, atomized individuals completely. We have families, we have groups of friends, we have communities, we have groups of people with which we are a part, but these groups are distinct, they have histories, they have futures, people are concerned with maintaining the future of them, um, and they're, they're, they maintain themselves. And he says when he says, when the time arrived, when nothing in the individual's immediate and real environment was any longer made, shaped, or fashioned by that individual, everything that comes, comes as gratification of momentary need. There's no past involved. It's just, you know, an immediate need and an immediate fulfillment of that need. Uh, he says that when everything becomes despiritualized and everything is simply like your, your day's work constitutes that which you're doing now it's nothing is connected to an ongoing sequence from the past into the future in other words there's no there's no this is who we, we were this is who we are this is who we will be and we care about this thing it's just you're you you have an immediate need for something like food or shelter and the system provides it for you he says he says, then man was, as it were, bereft of his world, cast adrift in this way, lacking all sense of historical continuity with past or future, man cannot remain man. The universalization of the life order threatens to reduce the life of the real man in a real world to mere functioning. So, it's, he's talking about the universalization of the life order. When he talks about the life order, he's talking about, he talks about different types of life in this book. He talks about like like the maintenance of biological life, providing you with shelter, providing you with with food and water, the and enter, entertainment, uh, the basic things that the that the the apparatus provides you with. This is the maintenance of the life order. The universalization of the life order threatens to reduce the life of the real man in a real world to mere functioning. So there's like, there's true life, and then there's basic biological living. But the life, it's an unfulfilled life. You know, there, there's a distinction between like a, a life toward, ful, toward fulfillment, and it's not just an individual fulfillment, but it's a fulfillment of these historical groups. That's like a, that's like a, a real individual life that's self-determining or or is is de self-determining in conjunction with the sort of uh community so let me jump to the next section when he's talking about uh technique or technology in this section he says quote the upshot of technical advances as far as everyday life is concerned has been that there is a trustworthy supply of necessaries but in a way which makes us take less pleasure in them, because they come to us as a matter of course, instead of with the relish given by a sense of positive fulfillment. Being mere materials, obtainable at a moment's notice, in exchange for money, they lack the aroma of that which is produced by personal effort. Articles of consumption are supplied in the mass and are used up, their refuse being thrown away. They are readily interchangeable, one specimen being as good as another, in manufactured articles turned out in large quantities, no attempt is made to achieve a unique and precious quality, to produce something whose individuality makes it transcend fashion, something that will be carefully cherished. An article which thus satisfies ordinary needs arouses no peculiar sense of affection and is only felt to be important if it should chance to be unobtainable. In that last respect, certainly, a general security of provision, growing ever more extensive, intensifies the emotions of want and danger should anything go wrong with the supply. Among articles of consumption, we distinguish the well-adapted and substantially perfected kinds, the definitive forms whose manufacture have become thoroughly normalized. Such commodities have not sprung completely finished from one exceptional brain, but are the outcome of successive discoveries and improvements that have continued, perhaps, for more than a, gener a generation. The bicycle, for instance, took 20 years to pass through the various stages of its revolution, 
some of which now look to us more than a little comic, before attaining finality in a restricted number of minor varieties. Although the majority of articles of consumption still repel in one way or another by inelegancies of form, by errors of excess or defect, by unpracticalness in matters of detail, by maladaptions in point of technique or whatnot, the ideal shines forth, and in a fair number of instances has been attained. When perfectionment has gone as far as this, fondness for a particular specimen has become unmeaning. The general form is what matters to us, and however artificial that may be, such things have a functional suitability, which almost makes them seem like natural products rather than the creatures of man's activity. Thanks to the technical conquest of time and space by the daily press, modern travel, the cinema, wireless, etc., a universalization of contact has become possible. No longer is anything remote, mysterious, wonderful. All can participate as witness of events accounted great or important. Persons who occupy leading positions are as well known to us as if we rubbed shoulders with them day by day. The attitude of mind, characteristic of this world of advanced technique, has been termed positivism. The positivist does not want phrase-making, but knowledge. Not ponderings about meaning, but dexterous action. Not feelings, but objectivity. Not a study of mysterious influences, but a clear ascertainment of facts. Reports of what has been observed must be given concisely, plastically, without sentimentalism. An aggregate of disjointed data, even sound ones, producing the effect of being the relics of earlier education, are worth nothing. Constructive thought is demanded, rather than the making of many words. Simplicity and directness, rather than eloquence. Control and organization are supreme. The matter-of-factness of the technical realm makes its familiars skilled in their dealings with all things. The ease with which ideas about such matters are communicated standardizes knowledge. Hygiene and comfort schematize bodily and erotic life. Daily affairs are carried on in conformity with fixed rules. The desire to act in accordance with general conventions to avoid startling anyone by the unusual results in the establishment of a typical behavior which reconstructs upon a new plane something akin to the rule of taboos in primitive times. End quote. Okay, so here he talks, you can see he talks a little bit about, uh, let's say, the bicycle, how it came about and there were various types of bicycles and some of them were kind of comical looking and there was this attempt and that attempt and slowly the perfection came about like they figured out the right way to make a bicycle and then at the time of the writing you know there's only really minor little adjustments in the bicycle little cosmetic differences and even from then to now, there have been probably, you know, increases in perfections of the bicycle. And you see the same thing with cars where you, you may perhaps used to have a, a, a wider variety of cars. And then over time, they all started to sort of converge into the same shape, you know, where they're all, most cars are a sort of, you know, combination of like a car and a station wagon and SUV and they all sort of acquire the same sort of curves and the same sort of shape and they converge upon something and we feel like it's like the ideal just like the bicycle has converged upon the ideal bicycle the correct bicycle and all the varieties fade away and every bicycle is kind of like the other one and we don't value the individuality of a thing so much as we value how it closely it resembles the ideal of the thing the perfect bicycle how close is this to the perfect bicycle so there's there's like a, a distant ideal that we're after and any kind of nuance uh, that makes something unique is is seen as a flaw or a blemish and he talks about he calls that let's see he says he says, thanks to the technical conquest of time and space by the daily press, modern travel, the cinema, wireless, etc., a universalization of contact has become possible. No longer is anything remote, mysterious, wonderful. There's no mystery left in anything. There's no, there's no difference in anything. There's no inaccessibility of anything. And he talks about positivism, and he says that 
constructive thought is demanded rather than the making of many words, simplicity and directness rather than eloquence. It's like bo everything boils down to its most basic component. And uh, embellishment, eloquence, it's all sort of unnecessary, right? It's all deviation from the ideal. And the ideal is not toward beauty, it's toward functionality, right? There's no, it's not like a, a quest for perfectly ideal beauty or anything like that. And it's not, a, it's not a, a, an exercise in creativity. It's just seeking the most efficient, basic way to accomplish the task at hand with minimal deviation. And this is like the, univer the universalization of everything. And it's the same way with news and information. Everybody gets the same information, whatever's the most important pieces of information. Those are the pieces of information that every single person gets. They're, the quest for efficiency is in many ways the same as a, as a quest for universalization and sameness. I mean, if there's only one most efficient way to do something and everybody's after the most efficient way, then everybody's going to do whatever the task is in the same way. The ideal, most efficient, optimized manner of engaging in whatever it is. This is, I mean, that's universalization. Everything is, becomes the same. Built, you see this in architecture where, you know, once upon a time, buildings here, there, and the other place all look different and they kind of converge toward a unified uh, shape and structure and any kind of difference is, is like more like a nod to, well, we're this culture, so we kind of like do things this way, but it's only just, it's not, it's not, it's not actually doing things that way. It's like, you know, um, fake, fake culture. It's like make-believe culture. Anyway, let me jump forward here uh, when he talks a little bit more about apparatus. So in this section, he says, quote, Inasmuch as the titanic apparatus for the provision of the elementary necessaries of human life reduces the individual to a mere function, it releases him from the obligation to conform to the traditional standards which of old formed the cement of society. It has been said that in modern times men have been shuffled together like grains of sand. They are elements of an apparatus, in which they occupy now one location, now another, not parts of a historical substance which they imbue with their selfhood. The number of those who lead this uprooted sort of life is continually on the increase, driven from pillar to post, then perhaps out of work for a lengthy period with nothing more than bare subsistence, they no longer have a definite place or status on the, in the whole. The profound saying that everyone ought to have his own niche to fulfill his own proper task in the scheme of creation has for them become a lying phrase used in the futile endeavor to console persons who feel themselves adrift and forsaken. What a man can do nowadays can only be done by one who takes short views. He has occupation, indeed, but his life has no continuity. What he does is done to good purpose, but is then finished once for all. The task may be repeated after the same fashion many times, but it cannot be repeated in such an intimate way as to become, one might say, part of the personality of the doer. It does not lead to an expansion of the selfhood. What has been done no longer counts, but only that which is actually being done. Oblivion is the basis of such a life, whose outlooks upon past and present shrink so much that scarcely anything remains in the mind but the bald present. Thus, life flows on its course devoid of memories and foresights, lacking the energy der derivable from a purposive and abstract outlook upon the part played in the apparatus. Love for things and human beings wanes and disappears. The machine-made products vanish from sight as soon as made and consumed, all that remains in view being the machinery by which new commodities are being made. The worker at the machine, concentrating upon immediate aims, has no time or inclination left for the contemplation of life as a whole. When the average functional capacity has become the standard of achievement, the individual is regarded with indifference. No one is indispensable. He is not himself, having no more genuine individuality than one pin in a row, a mere object of general utility. Those most effectively predestined 
to such a life are persons without any serious desire to be themselves. Such have the preference. It seems as if the world must be given over to mediocrities, to persons without a destiny, without a rank or a difference, without genuinely human attributes. It is as if the man, thus deracinated and reduced to the level of a thing, has lost the essence of humanity. Nothing appeals to him with the verity of substantial being, whether in enjoyment or discomfort, whether strenuous or fatigued, he is still nothing more than the function of his daily task. As he lives on from day to day, the only desire that may stir him beyond that of performing this task is the desire to occupy the best obtainable place in the apparatus. The mass of those who stay in their appointed situations becomes segregated from those who ruthlessly press forward. The former are passive, remain where they are, and amuse themselves in their leisure hours. The latter are active, being spurred on by ambition and the will to power, consumed as with fire by the thought of the chances of promotion, by the tensing of their utmost energies. The whole apparatus is guided by a bureaucracy, which is itself likewise an apparatus, human beings reduced to apparatus, one upon which all those at work in the greater apparatus are dependent. The state, the municipality, manufacturing and business enterprises, are controlled by bureaucracies. Today, men are associated for labor in multitudes, and their work must be organized. Those who force a way into the front ranks have secured advancement and enjoy higher consideration, but essentially they, too, are the slaves of their functions, which merely demand an alerter intelligence, a more specialized talent, and a more lively activity than those of the crowd." End quote. So yeah, there he's talking about the apparatus and he's talking about people and the way people become uh, cogs in the machine and each person is, uh, you know, re replaceable. And he talks a lot about the present. He talks about how um, uh, the, the machine made, he says, the machine made products vanish from sight as soon as made and consumed. All that remains in view being the machinery by which new commodities are made. Um, constantly concentrating on the present, there's no continuity. He says a person can do something again and again, but each time he's, he, he does it new, there's no, there's, there's not, it's not the sort of repetition that, that becomes a, really a part of his life. It just becomes a thing he does over and over again. But there's no, um, well, let's see, specifically he says, he says, what he does is done to good purpose, but it is then finished once for all. The task may be repeated after the same fashion many times, but it cannot be repeated in such an intimate way as to become, what you might say, part of the personality of the doer. It does not lead to expansion of the selfhood. It's just, I mean, what he's really describing is, is a lack of consciousness of the past and future and, a, and an obsession with... Uh, immediacy, an obsession with what one is doing now. One might you know, have this job and then go have that job and then have the other job and there's discontinuity. There's not, you know, there's not like a profession that one takes on as a part of his being. Uh, it's just jobs are just things people do. Um, so in some sense you might say that a person is separating from from their job to an extent but like their job then, their, what it is that, I mean, there's still something that they do that they identify with. So it sort of becomes the consumption, the leisurely consumption that one becomes identified with. But no matter, I mean, no matter how you look at it, I think he definitely has a, has a point about um, the, the immediacy of one's needs and one's desires and one's thought and not really looking at one's life as as a whole that one connects with that i connect with my past i connect with my parents past the past of my community the past of my environment and even like the past of myself it's it's always just what's happening right now there's a there's a constraint like blinders on a horse about what our um attention is focused on and it you you even see this with the news cycle the way, 
you know, the new shiny object comes into view and everybody's talking about it. And then when the next shiny object comes into view, the old shiny object kind of goes away. And may, you know, this isn't enti- this isn't like in the entirety of human existence, but it's more and it's it's an aspect of human existence. We don't I mean we don't completely utterly forget what happened yesterday, but it's an aspect of human existence and in particular it's an aspect of the media, it's an aspect of the world of employment. We're we're always thinking about I mean we're thinking about what's next, but we're only thinking about what's next as it relates to what's happening now. Like I think about what's next because I think that if I concern myself with what's next, I'll make more money. You know, I'll be a, a, a visionary sort of person who can make a better paycheck. Um, in which case, I'll be able to put put myself in a position to more effectively satiate my immediate desires. Um, it's a different sort of looking toward the future. Like even our even our our view to the future is constrained within the sense of how does this affect me now and even how will it affect my you know my future now you know what i'm saying it's like it's a it's a it's a perpetual um desire to to fulfill immediate needs and maybe that's just part of the human experience but i think that it's only it's it's not necessarily the highest part of human experience and it becomes more prominent the more we concern ourselves with like you know fulfilling our role as cogs in the great machine that is providing for the sustenance of humanity i mean sustenance is really like immediate the immediate food and shelter of human beings and the immediate entertainment of human beings the whole apparatus is is focused on perpetually providing for the present and 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 preparing and facilitating itself to continue in the future to provide for the perpetual present i guess is my point so let's move on from there in this section here uh he says quote imminent seems the collapse of that which for millenniums has constituted man's universe The new world, which has arisen as an apparatus for the supply of the necessaries of life, compels everything and everyone to serve it. It annihilates whatever it has no place for. Man seems to be undergoing absorption into that which is nothing more than a means to an end, into that which is devoid of purpose or significance. But therein he can find no satisfaction. It does not provide him with the things which give him value and dignity that which, amid the needs and stresses of the past, has persisted as an unquestioned background of his being, is now in course of disappearance. While he is expanding his life, he would seem to be sacrificing the being in which he realizes his own selfhood. Very general, therefore, is the conviction that there is something amiss with the scheme of things, that what really matters is out of order. Everything has become questionable, the substance of everything is threatened. It used to be said that we were living in a time of transition, but now every newspaper is talking of the world crisis. People who look for deeper causes discover the critical condition of the state, saying that when the method of government does not lead to the formation of any decisive will towards the whole, and that when the mood of assent vacillates, all foundations begin to crumble. Others speak of a crisis in civilization, resulting from the decomposition of our spiritual life. Yet others finally declare that the crisis affects the entire being of mankind. The limits of a mass order that claims to be absolute are becoming so plainly disclosed that the world staggers. The crisis realizes itself as a lack of confidence. If people still cling to the coercion of the law, if they are still convinced by power, and by the rigidity of convention. It is only because of a calculus of material advantages and not from any real confidence. When all has been reduced to the purposiveness of life interests, the consciousness of the substantiality of the whole has been destroyed. Today, in actual fact, no cause, no office, no profession, no person is regarded as worthy of trust 
until, in each concrete instance, satisfactory grounds for confidence has been disclosed. Every well-informed person is acquainted with the deceptions, the deviations, the untrustworthiness that prevail in his own familiar domain. Where confidence persists, it is only within very narrow circles, for it never extends to the totality. The crisis is universal, all-embracing. It is of multiple causation, so that it cannot be overcome by dealing with this or that particular cause, but must be apprehended, endured, and mastered as our worldwide destiny. From the outlook of technique and economics, all the problems mankind has to solve would seem to have become planetary in their scope. It is not merely that on the surface of our globe there has ensued a general interlacement of the economic conditions upon which the technical mastery of life depends, so that the world can only nowadays work as a unit, for an increasing number of persons have come to look upon it as demanding unification into a circumscribed area on which alone, under such unified conditions, their history can work itself out. The Great War was the first war in which practically the whole of mankind was involved. With the unification of our planet, there has begun a process of leveling down which people contemplate with horror. That which has today become general to our species is always the most superficial, the most trivial, and the most indifferent of human possibilities. Yet men strive to effect this leveling down as if, in that way, the unification of mankind could be brought about. On tropical plantations and in the fishing villages of the far north, the films of the great capitals are thrown on the screen. People dress alike. The conventionalities of daily intercourse are cosmopolitan. The same dances, the same types of thought, and the same catchwords, a compost derived from the Enlightenment, from Anglo-Saxon positivism, and from theological tradition, are making their way all over the world. At World Congresses, the same leveling down is furthered by those who, instead of aspiring to promote communication between heterogeneous entities, want unification upon a common basis in religion and philosophy. The races of man interbreed. The historical civilizations and cultures become detached from their roots and are merged into the techno-economic world in a vacant intellectualism. End quote. So he's talking about a couple things there. Um, first of all, he talks about how the there's an imminent collapse and a crisis that seems everybody seems aware of. The newspapers are all talking about world crisis. Some people look for the causes in the condition of the state that if the method of government isn't right, um, it won't it won't lead toward any decisive will to take action or um, a crisis in civilization uh, resulting from the decomposition of spiritual life or a worldwide crisis. Um, and he says it realizes itself in a lack of confidence that people don't trust each other. They don't trust uh, anyone or anything. Trust has to always be earned. We're always sort of in a default state of distrust, distrusting each other, distrusting our institutions, distrusting our neighbors, distrusting foreign nations. Uh, that's the manifestation of the crisis is a perpetual state of distrust. I think that's a that's an interesting concept because you, you could say we definitely live in a low trust uh, society. But what I think is is uh, interesting, he talks about from the outlook of technique and economics, um, all of the problems mankind has to solve have become planetary, and uh, the he says um, people people uh, believe that the world nowadays can only function as a unit so that an increasing number of people have come to look upon it demanding unification uh, and he mentions the great war meaning world war one the first war in which practically the whole of mankind was involved so that the wars that take place are all global wars um, obviously this is a long time ago and we've definitely seen regional wars uh, continue but certainly in the wake of world war one that might have seemed to be the the case that all war henceforth is global war. Uh, but, it, I mean, we see the same unification now. I mean, this is, like I said, almost 100 years later, and we're, as glo- we're more globalized now 
uh, than we were back then by leaps and bounds. When I, I get comments on my um, on my podcast from people all over the world, that, that's pretty remarkable. Um, he says, on tropical plantations and the fishing villages of the far north, the films of the great capitals are thrown on the screen. People dress alike. Um, people, we, we have, everybody has the same, it's the same as the, as the singular bicycle. We have the, the same, you know, aiming for efficiencies. Well, what if we can show the same movie? We only have to make, you know, 10 movies and we can show them to everybody all over the world. How efficient would that be? Um, you know, glo globalization and, and unification and universalization are factors of efficiency. And the drive, the drive toward efficiency is creating this sort of globalism. And the drive toward efficiency is built upon the need to uh, fulfill the needs of an ever-expanding number of people. I mean, the, pop, the, the level of population continues to be a factor in all of these phenomena. And he says the historical civilizations and cultures become detached from their roots and are merged in the techno-economic world and in a vacant intellectualism. And uh, he's absolutely right. The, the way that you could, the, the only difference between cultures seems to just be, uh, I mean, culture seems to be boiled down in large part to like a, a language and a cuisine. Uh, because it's not necessarily simple to change the languages that everyone speaks, but absent the variety of languages and absent perhaps um, different ethnic groups that are not immediately able to be merged together. Um, but those are only the areas that are most difficult to universalize. And it's still happening nonetheless as more people speak English all over the world or other languages become um, you know, universalized and people moving across the world in migration patterns so that ethnic mixing becomes the same, that the, per the ethnic makeup of a city in America becomes not all that different from the ethnic makeup of a city in Europe, and um, give, you know, given time, the and and the and the continuing process of globalization, the city, every city is going to look essentially the same. Um, the first and easiest is the architecture. Um, that's all. That's already universalized. Every city really looks the same from a from an architectural standpoint. Not exactly the same. Obviously, this isn't absolute, but it's certainly uh, more so and more so. And um, one one thing that I think is an important way to look at this sort of crisis, as he describes it. Um, if I could jump back to the beginning of that, where he says. He says, the new world, which has arisen as an apparatus for the supply of the necessaries of life, compels everything and everyone to serve it. It annihilates whatever it has no place for. So there's a, there's a compulsion for everything to serve the apparatus, which is, which is designed. And he says, the, the, the new world has arisen as an apparatus for the supply of the necess necessaries of life. Compels everything. And so there's a, th there's a threat from the apparatus of annihilating everything that doesn't serve it. So every distinction, every difference, every different type of bicycle, every different type of anything, every different type of architecture, every different ethnic group, every different language, everything that is inefficient runs the risk of being annihilated in the face of the global apparatus. So there's an annihilating quality to this whole thing. And there's, a, there's an alienating quality. There's a dehumanizing quality. There's a process by which people become indiscriminate cogs in the machine, no different really from one from the other, watching the same TV shows, laughing at the same jokes, wearing the same types of shoes. You know, no distinctions culturally, no distinctions individually. You're, you're, you're kind of supposed to just not ask any questions, be a sort of mindless component of the apparatus. And so there's an annihilating feature of the apparatus. And yet there's also a sort of annihilating prospect, I believe, of the fear of the collapse of the apparatus. 
Um, and this this is like I feel like we kind of stand between two uh, unpleasant outcomes. One of which is like ultimately looks like the Matrix. You know, uh, we're, we're all just totally plugged in. Nothing is real. Um, you know, we're we're in the virtual reality. We're interacting with artificial intelligence. Uh, our lives have become somewhat meaningless. And you know, there there's there's the threat of the apparatus taking over everything and driving everything that doesn't serve its purpose uh, out and annihilating everything that doesn't serve its purpose. And there's the threat that it collapses uh, when so many people, you know, it can't be uh, it can't be stopped. You know, so on the one hand, there's like the Matrix, but then on the other hand, there's like Mad Max, where the the collapse leads to you know massive scarcity, um, riots in the streets, starvation, famine. Um, you know, we're kind of we're we're kind of afraid of where it's going to lead us, but we we're also afraid of turning back. We're afraid that if we turn back, there's going to be this you know, this great amount of suffering that would occur. And so I think that's part of the crisis is that we're, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to like weave between these two, you know, we don't want to go too far down the technological road. We're already kind of skeptical about, you know, what AI is going to, is going to do to our lives and what, you know, transhumanism is going to look like. But we're also always sort of skeptical of, 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 collapsing civilization and uh and civil strife and the sort sort of um potentially really destructive process of the apparatus if you will no longer functioning so um i feel like that's an important part of the, of the nature of the crisis and then he talks a little bit about culture there's a few more sections i want to read where he's talking about culture and it seems like a rest it seems to me like he advocates for a sort of restoration of culture and a um a, he uses the phrase assimilation of of historical culture so plugging kind of plugging oneself into and manifesting uh our own individual cultures in order to in order to kind of combat this this unification this uh, universalization of the apparatus one would have to reach into the past and become one with the past and manifest the past and assimilate the past into one's life to connect with something that is uh, unique and is uh, separate from the apparatus. At least that's how I'm interpreting this. Let me go ahead and read this section on culture where he says, quote, culture is a form of life. Its backbone is mental discipline, the ability to think and its scope is an ordered knowledge. As its substance, it has a contemplation of the forms of that which has existed, cognition as coercively valid insight, a knowledge of things, and familiarity with words. For the broad masses of the population in the West, culture has hitherto been successful only along the path of humanism. But for individuals, other roads have been opened. He who in youth has learned Greek and Latin, has absorbed the writings of the classical poets, philosophers, and historians, has gained familiarity with mathematics, has studied the Bible and some of the great imaginative writers of his own country, will have entered into a world which, in its infinite mobility and expanse, will have endowed him with an inalienable intrinsic value, and will have given him the key to other worlds." But such education is, in virtue of its realization, simultaneously a selection. Not everyone who tries can unlock the treasure house. Many fail to do so, and acquire nothing more than superficialities. What is decisive is not a specific talent for languages, or for mathematics, or for the elements of a modern culture, but a readiness to receive mental impressions. A humanist education is that which exerts a selective influence upon the individual. Only this education, therefore, has the wonderful quality of being able to produce good results even though the teachers are inefficient. One who reads the Antigone and who revolts in this connection 
against being taught nothing but grammar and prosody, may still be profoundly impressed because the text lies before him. If we inquire why this task of humanistic culture has such remarkable advantages, an answer can only be found on historical lines, and not with some reference to any rational purposiveness of a humanist education. The actual fact is that we owe to the classical world the foundation of what, in the West, makes man all that he can be. In Hellas, the idea of culture was for the first time fully realized and understood in a way that ever since has been valid for every person of understanding. In the West, each great uplift of selfhood has been brought about by a fresh contact with the classical world. When that world has been forgotten, barbarism has always revived. Just as a boat cut loose from its moorings drifts aimlessly hither and thither at the mercy of the winds and the waves, so do we drift when we lose touch with the antique. Our primary foundation, changeable though it may be, is invariably the classical world. For the past of our own particular nation is effective only to a secondary extent and lacks an independent cultural energy. We are citizens of the Western world through our dependence upon a nationality which has become positive in virtue of a specific appropriation of classicism. Today, however, this classical culture is, in the best event, as far as the masses are concerned, merely tolerated. The number of persons to whom it really means something grows continually smaller. In the life of the mass order, the culture of the generality tends to conform to the demands of the average human being. Spirituality decays through being diffused among the masses when knowledge is impoverished in every possible way by rationalization until it becomes accessible to the crude understanding of all. As a result of the leveling down process, characteristic of the mass order, there is a tendency toward the disappearance of that stratum of cultured persons who have come into being thanks to a continuous disciplining of their thoughts and feelings so that they have been rendered capable of mental creation. The mass man has very little spare time, does not live a life that appertains to a whole, does not want to exert himself, except for some concrete aim which can be expressed in terms of utility. He will not wait patiently while things ripen. Everything for him must provide some immediate gratification, and even his mental life must minister to his fleeting pleasures. That is why the essay has become the customary form of literature, why newspapers are taking the place of books, and why desultory reading has been substituted for the perusal of works that can serve as an accompaniment to life. People read quickly and cursorily. They demand brevity. Not the brevity, the terseness, which can form the starting point of serious meditation, but the brevity which swiftly provides what they want to know and furnishes data which can be as swiftly forgotten. No longer is the reader in mental communion with what he reads. Culture now signifies something which never acquires a form, but is to emerge with extraordinary intensity out of a vacancy into which there is a speedy return. The associated estimates of value are typical. Men are quickly satiated with what they have heard, and are therefore ever on the search for novelties, since nothing else tickles their fancy. Novelties are claimed as the primal knowledge of which people are in search. But they are whistled down the wind a moment after, since all that is wanted is sensation. Being fully aware that he lives in an epoch when a new world is in process of formation and a world in which the past no longer counts, he who craves for novelty is continually prattling of the new as if, because novel, it must necessarily be effective. He speaks of new thought, a new sense of life, the new physical culture, a new objectivity, the new economics, etc. If anything be new, it must be of positive value. If it be not new, it is regarded as of little worth. Though a man has nothing whatever to say, he is still possessed of an understanding, and can, when difficulties arise, employ this simply as a force for resistance, and merely to be intelligent is considered to imply a mental capacity for true existence. People have no sense of close kinship with their fellows, can no longer love them, but only make use of them, only have comrades and enemies on a plane of abstract theory or for the fulfillment of some obvious purpose. 
The individual is deemed interesting, not for his own sake, but simply because he is stimulating, and the stimulus ceases to work as long as he no longer surprises. When people describe anyone as cultured, all they mean is that he has the faculty of appearing new, intelligent, and interesting. The domain of this culture is discussion, which today has become a mass phenomenon. Yet discussion, instead of furnishing the pleasure which finds expression in the three foregoing estimates, could only give true gratification if it were a genuine form of communication as the expression of a struggle of conflicting fates or as the imparting of experience and cognitions belonging to a jointly constituted world. End quote. So he begins to talk about culture and... He really uh, drives it back to cl the classical world as the root of uh, Western culture and says that essentially in order to become a cultured person, in order to connect with your culture, in order to have a culture, uh, you have to come to terms with, you have to engage with and encounter the classical world. Uh, absent that, you have no real basis, you have no familiarity with the essence of your own culture. He talks about the leveling down of culture, uh, and he's really, he goes on from there talking about novelty. Um, he says uh, how people demand brevity, and it, they just want, I mean, it's, it's again, it's all about immediacy. They want uh, the brevity which swiftly provides what they want to know and furnishes data which can be as swiftly forgotten. Uh, he talks about the obsession with newness, uh, the kind of as a substitution for culture, somebody who can um, always be seen as as on top of the latest thing. That's kind of what culture it is. Being cultured is providing intelligent, uh, in interesting conversation, like stimulation, surprising. When you're no longer capable of, of surprising people, then you're no longer interesting, you're no longer cultured. He says, when people describe anyone as cultured, all they mean is that he has the faculty of appearing new, intelligent, and interesting. Uh, but he's, he's advocating for a deeper culture, a culture which is embedding oneself into the, the greater culture with, in which one is, you know, uh, in, in the inheritor of. We're all the, inher the inheritors of the culture of our forefathers, right, which traces back to classicism. So to be cultured is to be plugged into your culture and not just to be able to, you know, spit out interesting factoids at cocktail parties. Um, anyway, um, in, in, along those lines, he talks about assimilation into one's culture, historical assimilation. And in that regard, he says the following. He says, quote, there has arisen an enmity to culture, which reduces the value of mental activity to a technical capacity and to the expression of the minimum of crude life. This attitude is correlative to the process of the technicization of the planet and of the life of the individual, wherein, among all nations, there has been a breach in historical tradition, so that everything has been placed upon new foundations. Nothing can continue to exist except that which finds its technical rationale in the new world created by the West, but which, though thus Western in its origins, is universally valid in its significance and its effects. Hence, human existence has been shaken to its roots. The disturbance, as far as the West is concerned, is the most extensive that has ever been experienced, but because it is the outcome of the mental development peculiar to the West, it is part of the continuity of the world to which it belongs. In the case of other civilizations than a w the Western, however, it assails them from without as a catastrophe. Nothing can persist in its traditional form. The great civilized nations of India and of the Far East are confronted by the same fundamental problem. They are compelled to undergo a transformation which will adapt them to the world of technical civilization with its sociological causes and consequences, for in default of this, they will perish. Whilst an enmity to culture is grinding to powder all that has hitherto existed with an arrogant assumption that the world is now beginning entirely afresh, in the process of reconstitution, the mental substance can only be preserved by a sort of historical remembrance, 
which must be something more than a mere knowledge of the past, and must take the form of a contemporary vital force. In default of this, man would slip back into barbarism. The overwhelming radicalness of the crisis of our era pales before the eternal substance in whose being memory participates as in the immortal elements common to all times. Hostility to the past, therefore, is one of the birth pangs of the new valuation of historicity. This historicity itself is at war with historism as a false historicity insofar as it has become a spurious and substitute culture. For remembrance, as a mere knowledge of the past, is nothing more than a collection of an infinite number of antiquarian details. Remembrance, as mere contemplation, instinct, with understanding, realizes the pictures and the figures of the past only as non-committal confrontation. It is not until remembrance takes the form of assimilation that there comes into being the reality of the selfhood of a contemporary human being in the form of veneration, subsequently as a standard for his own feeling and activity, and finally as participation in his own eternal being. The problem of the mode of remembrance is the problem of such culture as still remains possible. Everywhere, widely diffused institutions subserve our knowledge of the past. The extent to which the modern world is concerned about such institutions manifests a deep-lying instinct which, amid the general destruction of culture, nevertheless refuses to accept the possibility of a complete breach in historical continuity. The works of the past are preserved in museums, libraries, and archives with the consciousness that something irreplaceable is being safeguarded, even though, for the moment, it be not properly understood. Men of all parties, all ways of thinking, and all nations make common cause today in this activity, whose watchful fidelity has never been so widely generalized or taken so much as a matter of course. The vestiges of history are protected and cared for wherever possible. What of old times was great lives on, so to say, as a mummy, and becomes an object of pilgrimage. Places which once played a great part in the world and realized the splendor of Republican independence are now kept going by an influx of foreign visitors. The whole of Europe has become, in a sense, a huge museum of the history of Western mankind. In the trend toward historical commemorations, towards festivals recording the foundation of states, towns, universities, theaters, the birth and death of persons of note, remembrance, even though devoid of any fulfillment characterized by intrinsic worth, still discloses itself as a symptom of the will to preservation, end quote. So just, uh, he's, he's talking about uh, two kind of different types of remembrance. Um, there's, there's the uh, collection of antiquarian details. He says, remembrance as a mere knowledge of the past is nothing more than a collection of an infinite number of antiquarian details. Um, but he's, then he says, it's not until remembrance takes the form of assimilation that there comes into being the reality of the selfhood of a contemporary human being in the form of veneration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's kind of two different forms of remembrance, a, a collection of details and, um, you know, like, like history just as knowledge, oh, I know this happened, I know that happened, versus assimilating his, the history of, of culture into one's life. He says it's sort of preserved. He says the, the, the works of the past are preserved in museums, libraries, and archives with the consciousness that something irreplaceable is being safeguarded, even though for the moment it be not properly understood. And he says that this is an ongoing, it's, it's, it's actually like a huge thing. Uh, all nations make common cause today in this activity um, whose watchful fidelity has never been so widely generalized or taken so much as a matter of course. The more, the more things are changing in the world, people realize that something of value in the past is being lost and must be preserved, even though people don't entirely understand what they need to do to actively uh, participate in the past and to gain the real value of these things which are being preserved. He says... Uh, he says the whole of Europe has become, in a sense, a huge museum of the history of Western man mankind. He says the trend toward historical commemorations, festivals of the foundation of states, 
of the birth and death of persons of notes, all this sort of um, recollection and celebration of components of the past. It's all, uh, it discloses itself as a symptom of the will to preservation. So there's sort of a sense somewhere, perhaps subconscious, that there's components of the past that must be preserved. And he also says, uh, he says, the extent to which the modern world is concerned about such institutions manifests a deep lying instinct which, amid the general destruction of culture, nevertheless refuses to accept the possibility of a complete breach in historical continuity. So the idea is like, like there's a, there is, there's a separation. There's the past and uh, uh, of individual cultures. There's a, there's a past of a spiritualized world. There's just a fundamentally different world of the past. And then there's the world of the now. And there's a there's a the implication of a of a breach or a separation, a historical breach between the way we are now and the way we were then. Uh, but that somewhere inside of us, we we refuse to accept a complete and total breach. We refuse to just allow the past to just be wiped away. Um, I mean, why is it that we feel it's important? Why is it that we feel that the the the, the things of the past must be preserved? That the the dates of things that have happened in the past must be remembered and continue to be celebrated. Why do we still feel like we should celebrate the 4th of July, if you will, or any other date from the past because we refuse to have to allow for a total separation between our present and our past, right? We, we have a, an instinctive drive to connect to the past. And we, it's not just, um, it's not just a matter of, of, you know, it doesn't really matter whether or not we remember any of the stuff or whether or not we keep these relics or, you know, like when ISIS was smashing up those artifacts, everyone around the world was like, ah, you know, pulling out their hair. How can this happen? Um, we don't want to just allow the past to be to be bulldozed and wiped out and replaced with the new, right? We want, we're instinctively we don't choose to, 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 to revere the past, but we instinctively revere the past um, because we, we sense that something great is being lost and that we should not, uh, should not live like that. So that talk of, that talk of assimilation, uh, I'm not going to carry on any, any more from there. I recommend you pick up this book and, you know, there's lots of, of additional parts in here that clearly, you know, I didn't get to. Um, and he does talk some more about that concept of assimilation. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's, it's important for us to be criticizing modernity. And I think that he talks in here um, about, in some sense, some of the same thing that Alexander Dugan talked about um, when I read uh, The Rise of the Fourth Political Theory and he was criticizing modernity and talking about how there are two different aspects of modernity. There's the social and the technological. And we should make sure that we remember that uh, these two these two components of modernity are somewhat bound up with one another, and uh, it's probably wise for us to criticize both the technological and the social, and and kind of understand how the one relates to the other, how the one causes the other, and how bound up they are, and how it's not necessarily easy or possible to just take bits and pieces of modernity and reject them uh, without understanding that you know in some sense. We have to reject modernity as a whole, and yet in some other sense, we can't. And also, right, I mean, as I said previously, there's there's parts of modernity that we don't really want to reject. There's certain, you know, information we've gained through scientific study that we don't want to just forget, nor do we really want to abandon the, the, the project of, of learning and understanding about the nature of reality. Um, and so how we go about picking and choosing parts of modernity to keep and get rid of while simultaneously recognizing that all these different parts of modernity are bound up in one another and they're all sort of serving similar, you know, a similar goal. Um, do, do, do we have to rethink some of our objectives? What, the, the object, what objectives are being fulfilled by the project of modernity and can we still pursue those objectives through other means or do we have to simply abandon those objectives you know it's it's certainly not a simple easy question 
uh, that can be answered in one book review. But um, it is it is kind of interesting how he talks about culture and the assimilation of the past in in terms of of that being a sort of potential uh, solution to the crisis, or at least something that will help us. Um, you know, drawing from the past and specifically drawing from classical times, aka like ancient Greece, the ancient Greek philosophers, ancient Rome, the classical pre-Christian world that constitutes the foundations of our civilization, that we ought to be looking back on some of that stuff and and drawing on that and assimilating some of that into our modern uh, frame of mind to help us contend with the crisis of technique and apparatus and mass man. So with all that said, I will close this episode out. I thank you very much for making it all the way through to the end, and I'll talk to you again next time. Goodbye.